So today we're going to do a deep dive on things that will potentially break your fast and things that may not break your fast. So the topic of breaking your fast seems to come up over and over and over as far as a major confusion for a lot of people. So I'm going to take each little part of this and attempt to try to help you understand it in a very simple way. We'll see if I could pull it off. A true fast, when we're talking about a water fast, involves not eating and only drinking water, nothing else. Okay, so if you were to consume vitamins or coffee or anything, you are breaking the fast. Okay, um, dry fast, you're not consuming any water, you're not eating anything. Okay, that's what a dry fast is. Now, what I want to get into is the degrees of breaking a fast because there's a lot of things that will, in a very minor way, possibly break your fast, but only in a temporary way, maybe for only 20 minutes to a half hour. So I am going to recommend consuming certain things during your fast because it's a real minor point. It's nothing to put attention on, and but I want you to understand the relative degrees of things that will break your fast versus those things that are very, very tiny that will only break your fast a little bit and for a short period of time. But we also have to differentiate between bumping you out of ketosis. That seems to be a confusion as well. Ketosis is the state of producing ketones from fat. Now, if you're consuming MCT oil or exogenous ketones as a supplement, okay, you're going to be in ketosis regardless of what you eat and regardless of what's happening with your own fat. So let's differentiate your body making ketones, like your liver actually producing ketones from your own fat versus you taking ketones externally and your body's not actually making your own ketones. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is this right here, things that bump you out of fat burning. Now, if you're taking exogenous ketones, okay, as a supplement or MCT oil or coconut oil or consuming butter, you'll be in ketosis but you're not necessarily going to be burning fat because your body is using the dietary fat or the dietary ketones instead of your own reserve. Okay, so we have the degree of fat burning that you're in, and then we have the level of ketosis, and then we have fasting. Now, the main benefit of being in a fast are these four things right here. Ketosis, autophagy, decreasing insulin, and fat burning. Each one of these is a huge benefit. Just being in ketosis will help you lose weight, help your brain regenerate, give you energy. I mean, think about it. Ketones are antioxidants. It's going to reduce oxidation in your body. So it's going to actually counter a lot of disease processes. Also, ketones will feed a damaged heart better than glucose. Ketones will feed a damaged brain better than glucose. So there's a lot of benefits of being in ketosis and also even taking ketones in general. Autophagy. Okay, the benefits of autophagy from going on a fast are huge. You get to recycle old damaged proteins. You're actually cleaning up microbes, candida, viruses from the body. Uh, this is very anti-aging. And you're also recycling other nutrients as well. And I'll probably do a separate video just on this one topic. But as soon as you start consuming carbs to any degree, you're going to slow down autophagy. Eating protein will also slow down autophagy. So a true fast is the ultimate way. But if you're taking supplements, for example, it's going to be a very minor effect on this right here. It's going to inhibit autophagy only a tiny bit because there's barely any calories. So we have to look at the quantity of calories. Are those calories more carbohydrate? Are they protein? Are they fat? I'm going to do a separate video just on that. But the point is that autophagy is a huge benefit of going on a fast. Also, the benefit of lowering insulin is huge too. Uh, it helps to reverse a fatty liver. It helps to improve your cholesterol and lipid profile. It helps the brain in general. It helps diabetes, insulin resistance, and the list goes on and on and on, including also acne as well. All right, then we have the benefit of fat burning. Well, weight loss is a great benefit of burning fat. Also, your hunger goes down. I forgot to mention that with all of these right here. So basically, you're not hungry anymore, so your cravings go away. Now, when we're talking about breaking a fast, we really just need to know what will create the 
the most smallest effect on insulin. The more insulin you have in your body, the greater this is going to knock you out of being in a fast and the less benefits you're going to have. So the more um, refined the carbohydrate is, the higher that food is on that glycemic index, the worse the effect. Uh, the worst food that you can consume is something called maltodextrin, which it's surprising that is in a lot of so-called keto-friendly foods or snacks that they sell. And then we have protein. Protein also has the effect of breaking a fast uh, because it increases insulin, not to the degree that a carbohydrate will, but to a large degree, especially if you're consuming larger quantities of protein. Then calories in general, despite what those calories are, because the calories that you consume trigger something in your small intestine that triggers insulin to go up. Okay, so we really have calories and protein and carbs. Now there are things that have a zero effect on insulin like fiber and fat, but if you're consuming large amounts of fiber or fat with calories, it could influence insulin a small amount, okay? But if we compare this to this, these are, these are higher. Also realize when you consume fiber, you can't digest fiber, so the microbes digest it. And the effect of your microbes consuming fiber, you can't digest it, your microbes digest it, they consume it, and then they uh, release this thing called butyrate, which is ketone-like, and indirectly, it'll help your blood sugars and reduce insulin. So fiber is actually very, very good to help with blood sugar problems and reducing insulin. But of course, if you consume a tremendous amount of fat, it's going to raise insulin a small amount just for the fact of these calories right here. Okay, so I hope you have that so far. Let's go to the next page right here. Okay, so I kind of created a list here of looking at insulin, ketones, and actual weight loss. And I already covered the benefit. So you know the benefit of this, lowering insulin, the benefit of this, and fat burning and of course autophagy, but that one's gonna be for a separate video. So let's take a look at coffee. Coffee really is gonna have an insignificant effect on insulin, okay? It's a small amount of calories. Uh, there's hardly any carbs in there, um, hardly any protein. Um, so it's gonna have a zero effect on ketones and a zero effect on weight loss or weak, weight gain. Uh, now, if you consume a tremendous amount of coffee with all the caffeine, it could increase uh, cortisol, potentially that could actually activate insulin. So stress can make you fat because stress mobilizes your own protein, which then will be converted into sugar, which then could raise insulin too. So uh, I just wanna bring that up. Um, and then we have tea. Tea pretty much has a zero effect on insulin. It's much less in caffeine, zero effect on ketones, zero effect on weight loss. So even though the true definition of a water fast is just drinking water, nothing else, none of these, I'm still gonna recommend some of these because it's gonna create just this very, very small effect which is basically insignificant, okay? Because we're looking at the effect on insulin, the effect on ketones, and is it gonna stop your weight loss? Okay, gum. Well, that really depends on what kind of gum you're chewing, okay? If you're doing a sugar-free gum, um, it's going to have a very small effect on insulin, ketones, and weight loss, unless it has something called aspartame or NutraSweet. The problem with this is that it affects your microbes in a way that can lead to insulin resistance. I'm going to put a link down below for more data on this if you want to have a deep dive in exactly what it does. But it, the studies show, of course, in mice, not in humans, but just as a side note, from working with tens of thousands of people over the years, I've noticed that those people who consume this chronically um, nearly always have a weight problem. So this chemical does affect our gut, which can lead to insulin resistance, which can increase insulin, especially if it's done chronically. So this depends what type of gum. If, if it's sweetened with xylitol, you're just talking about a very, very small amount. Even though xylitol is a sugar alcohol and it's not zero on the glycemic index, it's like 30, it's such a small amount, it's really gonna be an insignificant effect of insulin, ketones, and weight loss. So um, I wouldn't even worry about this right here. 
of course, if you're chewing regular gum with sugar, that is a problem because there's a lot of sugar in gum. Vitamins, near zero effect on insulin, ketones, and weight loss, either up or down. Okay, so vitamins are totally fine, and I recommend them when you're doing fasting because you may be deficient and you want to avoid any possible um, problem with having some deficiency and then fasting and then ending up feeling faint or dizzy or whatever because you didn't have that reserve. Okay, then we have the green powder, okay? You have the green powder with the fiber and you have green powder without the fiber, as in uh, wheatgrass juice powder. Both of those products really will create a insignificant effect on insulin, ketones, and weight loss. I mean, even one scoop of the wheatgrass juice powder is less than one carbohydrate. So it's such a small amount, uh, you don't have to worry about it. Bone broth, okay? It really depends how much bone broth you're consuming, but bone broth has protein in it, and that protein can increase insulin, but it all depends on the quantity. Of course, it's not gonna be the same as eating a steak, but there is still protein in there. Because remember, carbohydrates, protein and calories can in increase insulin, which can then lower ketones. Now, as far as weight loss, it really depends on the quantity uh, that you consume and how much insulin is being spiked. Now, if we go to collagen, collagen has a bit more protein, okay? And of course, this depends on how much you're consuming, it's going to increase insulin. So it's not a good thing to consume when you're fasting. In fact, both of these are not a good thing to consume when you're fasting, because they're gonna lower ketones. Why even consume them? And depending on how much you consume, it may or may not affect your weight loss. Then you have branched chain amino acids. Now, the problem with this is there's only three amino acids. You don't have all the essential amino acids. So when you consume only three, you cannot build uh, proteins. It's impossible with three amino acids. So this is gonna be used primarily as fuel. Depending on what type of protein you have, whether it's egg, meat, dairy, soy, whey protein, you're gonna have between 16 to 49% of that protein actually turning into body tissue, turning into muscle or other proteins that are in your body. Okay, that's at the very most, and this is basically, I think it's 48%, that's an egg. Breast milk, I think it's 49%. That has the highest amount of that protein turning into body tissues. I'm not talking about absorption, I'm talking about actually ending up at, in your muscles in repair or rebuilding certain proteins. 16% to 48% because we're not gonna talk about breast milk because chances are you're not consuming breast milk unless you're a baby watching my video. Okay, so 16 to 48% of that, okay, turns into body tissue. That means that 52 to 84% of that product is not turning into body tissue. Where is it going? It's either going out as waste, as urea, nitrogen waste, or it's being used as fuel, okay? So it turns into glucose. So a lot of the protein that people consume is not creating an anabolic effect, which is a, a building effect. It's creating a catabolic effect. It's breaking down into uh, a carbohydrate. An anabolic effect would be the turning of uh, protein into body tissue. But there is a group of amino acid in a certain ratio that will absorb at 99%. So only 1% of it is wasted. Okay, so that means 99% of it is anabolic. This is something that you could do during a fast, especially around your workout, because you're not getting the insulin spike. In fact, a lot of it is not even ending up as calories because it's being converted anabolically to body tissue, especially if you're not taking a tremendous amount, you're just doing the right amount for your body to use to create a building anabolic effect. All right, so we already talked about aspartame right here, sugar alcohols. I'm gonna put a link of a video just on sugar alcohols because I cover this in depth, but I just wanna give you a summarized version with this right here. So you have erythritol, which has a zero effect on the glycemic index. So that's not going to affect insulin or ketones or weight loss. However, 
Some people have a lot of digestive issues with that, and sometimes they will retain water, so they may, may gain weight on it, but it's water weight. So you, you don't want to do too much. Then you have xylitol, um, which is 30 on the glycemic index. So if you're consuming a very small amount of it, let's say in your coffee, it'll have a very small effect on insulin and ketosis. However, it does have an effect. So it really depends on your goals and how slow your metabolism is and uh, what you're trying to achieve. Then you have something called maltitol, which is a type of sugar alcohol that is the absolute worst. It's like over 50. So you wanna stay away from that one. And then there are other things like corn fiber and inulin. Uh, I have noticed that people have a lot of digestive issues with those. So again, it may not trigger insulin or affect ketones, but it, you can have some water retention with that. Now, when we get to stevia or a monk fruit, those will have a zero effect on insulin and ketosis and, and weight loss. So you can do those without any problem at all. Fiber in general, has a zero effect on insulin and ketosis. Um, and I'm talking about the fiber from vegetables. I'm not talking about bran, which actually has the, it's loaded with uh, something called phytic acid, which could block your zinc, iron, and other minerals. And the other thing is if you're taking just straight fiber as inulin, or like in chicory root, or something like corn fiber, which could be GMO, so you might gain weight on this, but this is not actual fat, it's water retention. So this usually happens after you, you get this little keto dessert and um, you buy it from something and you consume it and then you feel bloated and you get really thirsty and you start drinking water and then your stomach gets more bloated. Well, that's really what's happening. So uh, some people can get away with it, some people can't. Okay, what about half and half in your coffee or cream? Well, it depends how much you consume. Um, I don't have a problem with it. Okay, especially if it's grass-fed or organic. I prefer cream to half and half because half and half has a little more carbs. But if you're only doing a small amount, I would not worry about this because it's gonna create just the, an insignificant effect on insulin and ketones. Maybe it's gonna bump you out of ketosis possibly for 20 minutes, okay? But that's not significant. Then we have actual butter or coconut oil, which do have a, a zero effect on insulin, okay? And it can increase your ketones, but you may not lose any weight because your body is using the dietary fat instead of your own fat as fuel. I've talked about that in the last slide. So just realize that you could overdo it with the fat. So if you're struggling and it's not, you're not losing weight, just cut back on the fat. I, I think the, the magic uh, amount of grams that I would recommend if you're struggling would be like something like 75 grams of fat per day. And, but you don't want to go too low though. So I think this would be a good number if you want to calculate that. Apple cider vinegar, okay, is going to create a zero effect on insulin, ketones, and weight loss. However, it can help insulin resistance. It can improve your blood sugars. So it could actually help you eventually uh, get into a deeper ketosis and help with weight loss. But when you drink it, it's not giving you ketones right away. And then we have lemon juice, okay? There are a small amount of carbs with lemon juice. So it really depends on how much you consume. If you're doing two tablespoons, I wouldn't worry about it. It's insignificant. Now, sometimes people do unsweetened cranberry juice. That has a little more carbs. So you might wanna be careful with that because I have had people consume unsweetened cranberry juice and that stopped their weight loss uh, now, if you have regular cranberry juice with the actual sugar that they add in there and other juices, that would be really bad. But I'm talking unsweetened. Even though it's bitter, there's a, a, quite a bit of carb in that product. So I would probably avoid that. But lemon juice is going to be fine. Now, if you have a whole uh, cup, you might have seven grams of carb. It's very small. It's going to bump you out maybe for an hour or two but it's gonna be insignificant. But normally people are just doing a tablespoon or two, which I would not worry about. All right, I covered a lot of information. I hope you now understand this a little bit better, and I hope you're not even more confused. But go ahead and review this and um, put some comments down below if you have any additional questions. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you're liking this content, please subscribe now and I will actually keep you updated on future videos.